Hello, I'm Lauren and welcome to Improving the World. I'm an international improviser based in Hong Kong and I speak to amazing improv women all over the world. Today I talk to Nadine Antler. She is a German in the very middle of Germany. I asked her where and she got weird and cagey because it's sort of hard to find her. I'm convinced she's in an underground bomb shelter somewhere waiting out the apocalypse. On the map, she's almost next to where it says Germany on Google Maps. So she's just there somewhere never to be found. We talk about what is good improv? And this idea of, are you doing it right? Can you do it right if you follow the rules? Hmm. We will define what good improv is, or at least discuss it. And I hope that you enjoy it. Hi, Nadine. Hello. So we are talking about what is good improv? Obviously talking about goodness. We're talking about racing, trying to be the best. So we get to look at these phenomenal human beings behind me running. I'm so excited to see their great thighs in action. On a totally different note, you are in the middle of nowhere, near Kassel, Germany, and you're between Hamburg and Wittsburg in terms of how you spend your energy. Let's see how my German is. Working with De Steifen Prisa in Hamburg and De Cactus in Wittsburg. Perfect. Awesome. Okay, so let's get into the goodness of improv. Nadine, if you keep studying improv, will you eventually get it if you're waiting to get on stage till you're getting it and you're good and you're doing it right. Will you just one day look back and go like, I'm doing it or will I know? When do I get it? Well, it's one of the things that I feel like as a younger improviser, you feel like this will happen one day. You look up to all the people on stage that you love and you feel like, oh, these people know how to do it. And I feel like a lot of people, they wait for this day and I feel like it's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. You're never going to get it. I know. It's disappointing, right? You wait to be the day when you're a good improviser. But my experience is that everyone who I know who is a great improviser, they don't think of themselves like, I know how to improvise. It's a journey. Everyone, wherever you are, you're still struggling. You're still learning. And even when you feel like you get it in one area of improvisation. There's so many other fields where you still are learning and trying to be better. Okay, so maybe the moment of getting it may not happen. What about in my trying to constantly better myself and going down that journey? Should I try to find a mentor or see someone on stage and go, that person's great, I wanna be like them? What do you think about this? It can be a wonderful way to learn and be inspired and choose a path because, I mean, we know there's so many different ways to improvise and so many different schools and skills that you can get. Finding a mentor can help you to go down a certain path that you're inspired by. But of course, there's also a danger, a danger of trying to be like someone else and not being yourself. I used to organize a big festival in Würzburg, Germany, big international festival. And on the anniversary of the 10th festival, I gave myself a treat. I only invited the people that I was most looking up to. So I was like, okay, who in the world would I love to have together? And I choose people from around the world. And then the opening session happened and I looked around the room and I had a big revelation. I was like, oh, they all freaks. You know, they are all very unique and very special in what they do. And no one of them is a genuine good improviser that doesn't stick out. So I was like, oh, they are so good because they completely say yes to who they are. They don't try to be like someone else. They just completely trust that whatever the impulse is leads them into a direction. And that makes them all very unique artists. And that was a big inspiration for myself to be like, I really have to stop trying to be a good improviser, a good performer doing the right thing, but I have to find what is my way of improvising, what is the stuff that inspires myself. When you said that they were all freaks, I immediately pictured arms growing out of faces and butts on backs or something and wings coming off of these people in the corner. And I was so sure that you had selected <laughs> people from the circuses around the world or something. Well, not quite. <laughs> I'm hearing you say that they are individual. They're owning and loving a specific thing that they're really good at. And they're just diving into that. And that is yeah. what's making them great. So when 
you see them through your eyes, you think they're amazing. And maybe from their own perspective, they're only kind of really into this one thing or good at this one thing. And there's the other 95% that they want to grow in still. Exactly. Yeah. And they say yes to the things that they're very good at. And there will always be fields that they are obviously not as good as the others. But by saying yes to the one thing that you can do like no one else. It makes you this performer that people are like, oh, when I play a show with her, it's like this, you know, and no one else can do this job. And I love that. Yeah. And then it always makes sure that you can learn from this person because they discovered something on their own. Okay. Talk to me about rules because we're talking about these little niches of improv and within improv, there are so many different kinds. As you said, there's a huge spectrum of styles within this art. A lot of the more games have rules. So the alphabet game, follow the alphabet along or stuff like that. So I'm going to make it a big question for the moment and then we'll get there. But what do you think about rules within improv? Well, as a German. <laughs> Germans love rules and we love to do things right and we love to do things as good as possible, which is in a lot of fields of life, a very good thing. So we really strive to learn from our mistakes to do it better. But my experience is when I teach Germans and also other people around the planet, but Germans, they stand out in this one. They really try to get it right and they try to understand the rules of a game before they do the game. They want to understand the rules of improvisation before they try it. It gets a lot in the way of improvising. I think the most beautiful thing is you start explaining an exercise and you feel like they've got enough information to go. I love it when students just go and then they might discover something that no one has done before. It sometimes happens, even when I'm really bad at explaining something. People start and I'm like, oh, of course, you can also understand it like that. And sometimes it leads to a beautiful thing. And sometimes it's just rubbish. It's still a lot of fun to try. Some of the beauty in improvisation for me lies into just trying and discovering something else. Of course, there's a lot of rules. You know, we all learn in the beginning, say yes, stop asking questions all the time and all this. But at some point, you have to let go of the rules and understand that they're just crutches to get you on the way, then you might have to let go and just be in the moment and discover what's there. So would you say that rules remove discovery? Because if we are only going by the rules that we know, we're not looking at these other pieces of the pie? Yes, they can. Yeah. I think so. I know a lot of students in improvisation that feel like they do good improvisation when they, you know, I defined who I am. I defined where the scene takes place. I defined our relationship. And still the scene is not interesting because it doesn't come from a place of inspiration. Really, the rules are just crutches. They just help us understand patterns, but they don't lead to great improvisation. There's a beautiful line in uh, Robert Mc his story. He says, this is a book about storytelling, but all the principles you find in this book, they will get you to a place where you learn how to do it. But it doesn't mean that there are not a thousand ways that are not in this book that will also lead you to great stories. So to all the people who love rules, it might be great, but it also might limit you and not discover all the other paths that are there as well. I think this is really interesting. You have figure it out. Many people maybe figured this out. Two words in German are very similar. Mut and Demut. What do they mean? And explain to me a little bit. To me, it's always been interesting why these words are so close. And especially with the D in the beginning, I wonder if it's a negation of the other word, but they're not completely opposites. And I think they're both important words for improvisers. Mut means being brave and demut means being humble. They are both very interesting concepts that we need on stage as improvisers. Yeah. Die in German is a negation. It means not or un. I think it can be, yeah. Yeah, right. So meaning that demut is humble, you said? Yes. Yeah. So humbleness could mean the lack of bravery in German. If we were kind of breaking down the language, it could be meaning this i don't want to say something that i'm completely sure of but i 
yeah, I think we need to do some research on this, but I think it could be understood like that if you look closely. But I think it's not. To me, it's interesting because there's a lot of talk about kill your ego when you go on stage. I wonder if that's possible because we go on stage, we will be seen, we need to bring ourselves. So a small bit of our ego is always in place, but at the same time, I feel like it's our job to stay humble and to still be brave. So to walk this line of, okay, I'm going to be brave. I'm going to show myself. I'm going to be out there and I'm going to not take it on. I'm not a better person or a worse person if I have a great scene or if I have a shitty scene. It doesn't matter. It's one of the hardest things to teach, I feel. You were saying there's always going to be a little bit of ego. Some of the improvisers that I know are so introverted and I think that they struggle with their self-image. Not the introversion and self-image or struggles. I'm just thinking of people. It's funny to me that we have this idea that because you're getting up on stage and you're a performer that you're like, whoa, big deal alert. And actually a lot of the great performers that I know, especially within improv, are more quiet and humble people and they don't have huge egos. Yet you see them on a stage where to your point, getting up on a stage, people paying to see you, maybe is itself a statement of some ego. Does that mean that the great improvisers I know have a little bit of ego, but have a balance of humbleness or they're fighting against their humbleness and trying to bring in some ego? I don't know, because obviously there's so many more skills that come into play when we talk about improvisation. Some of the great improvisers that I look up to, they are really good in supporting their partners and creating a comfortable atmosphere and handling failure very well. But also there's improvisers that are really funny and really great and owning the stage. It's the best if it all comes together in one person. But as we already discussed, everyone has their strong points. I love stepping on stage with people when it doesn't feel like a competition coming back to the race. <laughs> when it's not about who has done the funniest jokes tonight, but when it's really about discovering something together and listening, being aware, and then also being brave to put in your own view of the world and your own ideas. When you're teaching a mixture of anything within the spectrum of gender, is it hard to give a note to everyone? Because you have people in the room who automatically, they just feel like brave people and people who are in the room who just feel like more humble people. And if I just make a sweeping statement, I keep hearing consistently a lot of people I'm interviewing say that women tend, not all of you ladies, I know, not you, I know it's not me. Some of the ladies tend to be maybe a bit more humble, maybe give a bit more space, maybe a bit more quiet. And generally speaking, we have a lot of dudes who tend to be a bit more brave, loud, you tell them a rule, you have a feeling, go for it, and they do. Is it hard to give this note about balancing moot and demoot when not everyone's the same? Yeah, I have the same observation, and I think it's because we are brought up that way. Men are brought up with an idea of masculinity connected to being strong and not doubting yourself. Women are brought up with, you should be nice and smile at this person and they will like you. And it brings up all this kind of behavior that we struggle with when we grow up, probably also as kids. And then when I teach people in the room, I mainly try to teach individuals. I'm like, for this, I think you can step forward more, trust your ideas, go for it. And for other people, I'm like, I think your challenge is listening and thinking that your partner's ideas are smart, not stupid, less smart than your own ideas, at least. Well, that brings me to ask you if you have any words of wisdom that you want to share. I feel like we already said some really gorgeous things, but if you could speak to the younger version of you or the improv community as a whole or those who've never tried improv and are curious and they're creeping around the internet and they find this video, what are your words of wisdom, Nadine? Ah, <sighs> words of wisdom. Well, I would say along the lines of what was said today, there will not be the one day when you wake up and you know, today is the day and now I've got it. I'm the greatest improviser. Now I can own the stage. Now I can do everything because it's not this one moment of I have it. It's a constant journey. It's a constant learning it's a constant struggle. It's constant joy. It also means in the reverse, you're already good 
where you are. You don't have to try harder. You don't have to be someone else than you are. The beauty of all of us stepping on stage together is that we all bring ourselves with all the mistakes, with all the flaws, and with all our strength. I think one of the hardest things to achieve is saying yes to yourself and bringing just who we are. So maybe to answer the question that we had at the beginning of what is good improv, maybe what we're saying is that good improv is not trying to do good improv and not zeroing in on any one thing that you have to do, but letting your freak flag fly, letting that <laughs> arm come through your head, managing the balance of your own hubris as well as humbleness, your own moot and demoot, and just trying to achieve balance. Letting yourself go freaky and balanced at the same time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> okay. I do really, if anyone is an improviser who just left the circus recently, I would like to know, and please come find me. I would love to, <laughs> you know, do improv with you upside down or something. <laughs> Nadine, how do we find you? So if folks are feeling like they're going to be in the Hamburg region or if Castle or Pittsburgh or you are going to travel to them, they want to watch you, learn from you, play with you, throw money at you. How can they find you? I have a website. It's my name, Nadine Antler, dot B-E, because we're in Germany. I'm also on the Steife Brise website, steife-brise.de. And the cactus has a website as well. There minus cactus.de. And of course, my email is on my own website and I'm happy to work with all of you. Yay. Lovely. Well, thank you so very much for your time and your thoughts and your energy. It was so wonderful to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. And thank you all for watching. This is Improv in the World. I'm Lauren and there's more where that came from. Bye all. So, did you love the video? If you did, please say kind of beautiful things in the comments down below and you could subscribe if you're feeling sassy and look for more Improving the World. Thanks.